Thank you, Brother John Ivan, and greetings in Jesus' name. It's, it's been good to be here. I've already been blessed this morning with what was shared in Sunday school, and Joe touched on it a little bit, but and I don't, I won't get the exact words of the one song we sang. <clears throat> I believe it was the second one. The thought was about when I come in the presence of God and behold him in his glory and power. Then I'm forced to worship. And I had to think as as I was thinking along that line and then Joe shared about what we talked about in Sunday school, it's very hard for us as human beings to grasp the enormity and the power of God. And yet, when, we, when the little bit of facts that we know, that we observe around us, when we think about something that is spinning at the speed that the world is spinning, and we think about God stopping that and turning it back a little bit, we begin to realize in our minds, it helps us fathom the power that is there that things don't just destruct. You know, he didn't just stop time and make it go back. The Babylonians noted that he did that, but life went on as normal. Nothing destructed, things didn't fall apart, buildings didn't fall down, and all those things would be things that would happen in the real world if that happened. We know, but they didn't. Why? Because the God who made the rules that de declares that that's what will happen, he's not subject to those rules. We are hardly can fathom that, that God is not subject to those rules. He made them. He controls them. He holds, if you will, everything in the palm of his hand. Someone else alluded to the fact that he controls the heart of the king. The king's heart is in his hand, and it is. And we look and we say, but they're very evil men. God is still God. God moves through very evil men. We don't understand it. No, we don't. But he does. He has a plan and he has a purpose. And when we recognize that, when I recognize that, then I can truly rest simply in his palm. Because it's safe. It's absolutely safe place to be. Right in his hand. John Ivan already shared that my message is a qualification message for a minister. And you heard me preach a similar message about a year ago, maybe a little longer than that. So you'll probably hear me repeat myself a little bit. And I preach this message with a certain level of apprehension because I recognize full well I am preaching to myself. I haven't arrived. I don't have it figured out. I don't meet the bar completely. But by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I desire to live and practice these attributes that God is looking for. Not to my credit, but to his glory and to the benefit of the church. Another thing that was raised in Sunday school that resonates with me, and that is this morning we're going to look at qualifications and we're going to look at giftings. And there is no way that I, of my own ability, or anyone else, can meet either of those bars. 
There is nothing that I have, including my ability to stand in front of you this morning, that wasn't given by God. It's not mine. It's mine to exercise to God's glory, but it's not mine to claim. And I believe in our Sunday school lesson, that might be something Hezekiah didn't truly realize. It wasn't about Hezekiah. It was about God. And to this day, it's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's about God. And everything that we have, we were given for God's glory and for the benefit of the body. If you look at Acts chapter 6, which is where my text is, you will see that the church at that point in time found themselves at a time of conflict maybe, certainly a time of uncertainty, murmuring, um, not a time of being united and blessed. And yet out of that came something very good. Acts chapter 6, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. We start out with a bad situation. The Greeks and the Hebrews were disagreeing with each other. Somebody was being favored over somebody else. You know, human nature didn't change too much. Frank and I have had a couple conversations in the last 12 hours, and I didn't count the number of times we said this, but it was a few times we said, you know, human nature just hasn't changed all that much. It's still the same as it always was. And it was about various things we were talking about, not necessarily even about church. But that was a situation they found themselves. Human nature didn't change. There was favoritism. And so they came to the leaders and made their complaint. And the disciples came up with a plan. And the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, that, said it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. In the early part of my message, I'm going to skip over the gifts of preaching and teaching, not because they're not important, we're going to come back to them. But because I want to focus on looking at the qualifications that were needed here for the men they were supposed to seek out. I just want to make a point, so I don't forget to make it later, that as they sought out these seven men, it appears like they got a mixture of Greeks and Hebrews. And what I want you to take away from that is, I think the most effective ministry is team ministry. And when we bring our gifts and our views and our differing opinions together as a team, we actually minister to more people. Our differences empower us to better fulfill the work of ministry. So what were the qualifications? Look ye out among you seven men, the first one being of honest report. What does honest report mean? What is honest report? Well, it means a number of things. Probably the primary thing is a man of integrity. A man of whom... When people talk about him, 
They talk about him with good report. Someone who has integrity, both within the church and outside of the church. Someone who will do the right thing, even at his own cost, even at his own personal cost. To the point that he is willing to pay for the favor of another. Another aspect of that is not a gossiper. Not someone who likes to gather information and talk about. Not someone who wants to participate in the latest gossip maybe, but also scheme of uh, conspiracy theory, you name it. That, not someone who is unbalanced, not trustworthy, but rather someone who can be trusted. Someone who people say he has a good report. Someone who understands keeping things in confidence. Sometimes we hear the comment made, well, I'm telling you this so you can pray about it. Uh, I'm sorry, that's gossiping. That's just putting a lipstick on a pig. It's gossip. And in this particular point, I want to say this, that applies to his wife as well. The wife needs to be a woman of good report, not a gossiper, not someone who likes to talk. And I don't mean likes to talk in a way there's appropriate time to talk and share and hear and communicate, but that they keep it in, in confidence and have integrity. There's another aspect of this that's often hidden because in the church, you see me on a Sunday morning. You know me in my Sunday good behavior when I'm here. You know, Jenna wakes up with me every morning, and she sees me when I'm not so pretty, and when I'm a little bent out of shape, and when I'm not in good humor. But brothers and sisters, that same thing of good report applies to that as well. It applies to the man, what does his family see? What do his children say? What does his wife say? Because you've seen it, I'm sure, because I have. These men who are behind the pulpit, but if you talk to their family, you get a completely different story of who they are. That's a hypocrite. That's not a minister. That's not a godly man. That's a hypocrite. And when the qualification is of good report, what do the children say? What does the wife say? Does he have a good report? I'm going to pull in a, one verse from Titus here because it ties into this as well. And that is this. Titus, first Sorry, not Titus, I'm using Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. The word that's translated bishop there could be translated minister. It's really a servant, a spiritual servant. But the point I want to take away from there, this thing of good report, the husband of one wife, that doesn't mean he needs to be married. That's not what it means. What it really means that whether he's married or unmarried, that he knows how to conduct himself with women. He's a one-woman man. He's loyal. He's safe. A man who trusts, who demonstrates loyalty and trustworthiness and propriety and caution in his interaction 
with women and girls. That's what it really means. That's what the qualification is. Did you ever think about this? This is really telling. But did you ever think about Jesus and how he interacted with women? In Jesus' time, men didn't interact with women. And yet Jesus did. It was very unusual. But women saw Jesus as safe. And we miss this because it's not our culture. But when those women came and washed his feet with their tears and dried them with their, their hair, there's sexual connotation in that in that time. There is. I just want you to understand that. That's why this disciple said, if he would know what woman is touching him, he did. He did know what woman was touching. But the women knew who they were touching. That's the important part. The women knew who they were touching. He was safe. That's what the passage means. The husband of one wife. The next qualification is full of the Holy Ghost. A man who has had a life-changing walk with the Lord. One who is born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. One whose walk with the Lord gives example in his daily life, in word and in deed. One who faced, when faced with difficult situations, goes to God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not acting out of instinct or carnal desire, carnal behavior, but one who goes to the Lord. Walks daily in communication with the Lord and the Holy Spirit and knows what it's like to be a work of sanctification and that's an ongoing work it's not a completed work but knows what that is for the Holy Spirit to be working on sanctification the next one is wisdom What's wisdom? And we could define that a number of different ways. I'm going to use practical applications for it. But one in whom prudence, common sense, lie. Spiritual piety and uprightness alone are not sufficient to fill the office of a, a pastor or minister. They're needed. They're necessary. But along with them, a man must have common sense, good judgment. You know, have you ever heard the saying, I'm sure you probably have, uh, it's not as common as it was when I was growing up, but it would be said sometimes that a man would be so focused on spiritual things that he's really no earthly good. That's a man that isn't practicing wisdom. <clears throat> and common sense. It's a man who has to balance frugality and liberalness with money and time, knowing when to be frugal and when to be liberal. It's a man who has to do the same thing with strictness and leniency. You know, there's a time to be strict and hold a hard line. And then there's a time to show a little bit of grace and leniency because the outcome will be radically different if you don't. He needs discretion and good judgment. And I like to sum it all up in simply saying this. It's a man who needs life experience. He needs to have experienced some things in life himself so that he has wisdom, discretion, good judgment, self-control as he faces life as a shepherd.
If I would have preached this message 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have used these words I'm going to use next. He needs to be self-aware. That's not what I'm talking about. But the next phrase is, he needs emotional intelligence. And if you ask me, Jason, what is emotional intelligence? That's a fair question. Emotional intelligence is a more of a buzz thing in the last five years. So if you're younger, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's really critical in the life of a minister and pastor. It simply means this. It means that he understands how he appears and is understood to those he interacts with. He needs to understand that even though, even though my motives may be correct, it may not be helpful to you in how you see it. I may have the best of motives. I may not be doing anything wrong, but it's not going to work out well. I'm not emotionally intelligent. I'm going to give you an example that will help you understand it in case you haven't. But if, if, if I'm going to interact with a woman that was trafficked, let's just say I'm in a food line somewhere and there's a trafficked woman there and I say, you know what, I'm going to pay for her meal. That sounds really good to us and a Baptist people. That's wrong. Do you know what message she gets? That I want something from her. That I'm grooming her. That's emotional intelligence. To know, to know enough to say, no, I can't do that. I cannot do, that's what it will look like to her. That's what she will see. I'm white. I'm in a position of power. I have, I'm affluent. It sends the wrong message. It don't send the love of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm trying to send. But that's not what I'm conveying. That's emotional intelligence. And it's something we develop over time. And awareness. But it's important. He needs to be a man of humility. Who is submitted to leadership. And his Lord. Who's willing to put the flock first? A man who's willing to pay so the sheep don't have to. You've heard me say this because I know I preached an ordination message here, and I always say this when I do. But it's a point worth repeating. When you're in leadership, you have a choice that the flock doesn't have. And that is, I can choose to pay when it comes to some things, or if I choose not to, the flock will have to. The flock doesn't have a choice. If the leaders don't do what they need to do to pay the price to lead, the flock will pay. It's just one of the laws of God. So it needs to be a man who recognizes that and is willing to say, you know what? I don't want the sheep to pay. God put me here for this reason. And I will do, do what I'm called to do. And the same plea, I'm at verse 5 now, and the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to stop there. The next one is a man of faith. He needs to be grounded in the word and committed to believing and teaching it. One who's not shaken soon with new ideas. One who's not quick to buy into schemes and new ways of viewing things. One who's not always looking for a new understanding of how we could look at this particular passage. One who believes that the word has given us a revelation that we need. There's not going to be some more revelation. And you might say, well, why are you even bringing that up? I'm bringing that up because the world around us, even, 
even our Anabaptist community around us is full of this idea of, well, we can see it this way now. Yeah, I know that's how they saw it for the last 200 years. But we can see it this way. That takes us down a road. That is that we don't want to go down. That's not healthy. God isn't in the business of new revelation. He has given us the revelation we need. He's not going to give us some more now, even though there's those around us that will tell us that. We have sufficient. So one who is of faith, one who believes that, one who is grounded, and one who is willing to stand on that faith and truth. Even when things are in turmoil and uncertainty. Even when things aren't completely clear. There's plenty of things that we don't absolutely know 100%. But we don't major in those things. We go to the things that we do know. That God has given us. And then we view those other things through that lens. A man of faith. A man who knows what he believes. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now I'm diverging from qualification. It's part of my message. Look what happened when they got men who were qualified. Look what happened. They chose the seven men, and the church exploded. The church didn't just explode. The priests even saw what happened and were convinced. That's not an easy feat. By the way, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. But when people saw what happened, they saw God at work. That's what, that's what, that is a fruit of doing it God's way. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. I told you I would come back to the gifts of preaching and teaching. There is any number of men and women here this morning who can fulfill all the other qualifications to a T. That wouldn't make that wouldn't make that brother a good minister if he didn't have the gifts of preaching and teaching. They are required. The other qualifications are needed, but so are the gifts of preaching and teaching. And we see here with Stephen. Stephen is a good example of, he had all the other qualifications, but he could preach and he could teach. And people heard him, and the church grew. But it didn't take long for opposition to set in. Verse 9. Then arose certain of the synagogue, which are called the synagogue of the Libertarians, and the Cretans, and the Exalandrians, and then of Sicily and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. See what happened? Now, here's another qualification that this man needs. When that happened, a man can do a number of things. One, he can back down and he can stop doing that so that it don't cost him too much. Two, he can become combative and get into all kinds of fights and disagreements and arguments and combat. Or if he really is a man of faith and really a man controlled by God and the Holy Spirit, He's going to do exactly what Stephen did. Stephen kept preaching the word. Stephen kept preaching the word. He kept saying what 
the Holy Spirit gave him to say, and he was not carried away by his success. He wasn't. It didn't change him. His success in ministry did not change him. It didn't pull him away from God because it, it wasn't about Stephen. It was about God. Stephen wasn't preaching Stephen's message. Stephen was preaching God's message. He was single-mindedly committed to his Lord. And the forces inside and without didn't change him from that focus. He didn't waver. His faith held. You know, it cost him his life. We know that. And I'm going to end with verse 15. As he was there before the council, and all, and verse 15 says this here, here he's before the council. They brought a pack of lies against him. They paid men to say the untruth. Stephen didn't address that. What it says is, and as they all sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, they saw his face as it has been the face of an angel. And we know beyond this chapter that they took him out and they stoned him. And as they stoned him, the same thing happened. He said, I see heaven open. And the angels ascending and descending. And the onlookers said it looked as if he had the face of an angel. That's a really nice story. We like Bible stories. But for Stephen, it was real life. And I'm going to leave you with this. God is still looking for men and women like Stephen today. Yes, we are looking for women to fill the pulpit. And yet, we are looking for women to, to walk beside the man that fills the pulpit. That does a work behind the scenes. God is still looking for men and women like that today. He's still using men and women like that to build his church. And you know, Stephen was a man just like all of us are men. Stephen wasn't an angel. He wasn't necessarily without trial and struggle and temptation. But he rose above that in service to his Lord. Now, I used this example for the children in my introduction. You know, I recognize that I set before you a high bar that none of us can really meet of our own. But the Holy Spirit working in us can enable us to get closer to meeting that bar. But what we may miss is this. As I strive with desire to meet that bar and to bring glory to God, I bring a sweet-smelling savor, an incense to God, to his glory, by my willingness to be used of him. You know, when they went to, old, to the temple to worship in the scripture, they burned incense. And they burned it because to God it was a sweet smelling savor. That was expected. I would propose to you that my obedience, my submission, my desire to fill those qualifications is incense to God today. It, it glorifies him. It brings him satisfaction to see his people strive to meet what he is asking of them. To have a desire to meet the bar that he has set there, knowing full well that only by his power can they do it. He knows that just as well. He's fully aware of that. He created us. But it pleases him that we love him enough and value him enough and believe he is able enough 
that we're willing to strive and be used in his kingdom to build his church. Stephen, just like us, was a mere man. And yet, I talked about him this morning. We talk about him in Bible school. Sunday school lessons, Bible school lessons. We read books about it to our children. It brings glory to God. God is looking for you and I to bring him the same kind of glory. And if we're willing to submit to the Holy Spirit and we're willing to walk in humility and allow God to mold us and shape us, then we can take on these attributes and we can grow in them. And as we do that, God can use us to build his church. To reach the lost. And to glorify himself. That is our work and our calling as leaders and as men and women. To accomplish God's purpose. To bring him glory. And to build his kingdom, his church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to be gathered with your people. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who breaks the word to us, who empowers us, who enables us to walk worthy as your children. Thank you for Calvary, for the blood that was shed there. that we can claim on our lives that puts us in a right relationship with you, a relationship of sanctification and honor, a relationship that you can bless and that you can use us through that to build your church. Father, I pray that you would enable us throughout the coming week and weeks and however long you grant us life to be men and women of integrity Men and women who walk of good report, worthy of being called your sons and daughters, not by our merit, but by Christ's merit, but by our desire to be willing to come in submission to the Holy Spirit, to Christ in our lives. Father, I pray that you would continue to build your church here at Calvary specifically. I pray that as we go forward from here, You would reveal to us who you have chosen or what your plan is, Father, for we don't know the future, but you do. We do know that you have a purpose and a plan, and we can trust that. We do know that as we come, seeking in submission, you will reveal to us and guide us in that way, in that plan. Father, I pray for each one individually that you would bless us, give us strength, courage, those things in our lives that weigh us down, that challenge us. Lord, I pray that you would remove those hindrances, that you would heal, that you would encourage, that you would strengthen. Lord, I also pray that if there is pride in our hearts, rebellion, that your spirit would speak to us and we would be convicted, that we could come to the foot of the cross And we could submit to you, not like Hezekiah in our lesson this morning. Those 15 years weren't very beneficial. But rather, we would simply lay ourselves in the palm of your hand, for it is safe. And we would trust you, that you know what is good and what is best. And we would be willing to, out of that blessing and filling, walk as men and women who honor and glorify you and bless those around us. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.